first of its kind program to get more kids into college. From the moment they're born, you're thinking, how do I get this kid into a good school? How do I get this kid into, right? Is, am I wrong? So here with me this morning is Pamela Donnelly, an author and college admissions specialist. GATE is the first holistic approach to this process that anyone has come up with. It's an acronym. It stands for grades, applications, testing, and essays. So what I say is the parents hold the four keys and the kids go through the gate. Because in this age of educational technology, this stuff can live online, so we create a gate to be something that's on kids' cell phones. Because you know my kids, oh my gosh, that's cell phones. Yeah, it's right. all, girl, it's all on the cell Connected. phone. Right. So iPads, desktops, and laptops, so it's really very accessible now. It's going to be amazing watching this program in the next few years. And welcome to our webinar. We are so delighted that you're here. I'm your host, Pamela Donnelly. And get ready, because we have got an incredible amount of information we're going to be sharing with you today to help you competitively position your son or daughter for the right fit college with maximum merit-based financial aid. So as we get thinking about this process, I know that, that like me, you are probably pretty overwhelmed with all of the information that swirls around different opinions. I want you to know that everything we're gonna talk about in this webinar is data driven. It is founded in numbers and we're gonna be showing you charts and graphs and things. You're gonna wanna take notes. You're gonna wanna get screenshots and uh, hopefully you're just gonna have a great time with us. So uh, a warm welcome uh, from me to you. Moms, dads, students, let's go ahead and get started. You know, we've got some wonderful guests here, and I want to begin by thanking our partners. Valley Prep Tutoring, which is my company here in Los Angeles, is partnering all the way across this beautiful country with Diamond Nation in order to bring you this webinar today. They're based in Flemington, New Jersey, a best-in-class athletic destination for your students and something you truly want to check out if you don't know it already. We're going to begin by welcoming in the co-founder of Diamond Nation, my friend, Mr. Jack Cust Sr. Jack? Thank you, Pamela. Boy, that was an impressive opening. I really enjoyed watching all those success stories of all those kids. It was terrific. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, I want to thank everyone for signing on to our first ever educational webcast featuring Pamela Donnelly and her nationally acclaimed company, Valley Prep, who will be leading this webinar. We're very excited to provide this seminar after another successful year at Diamond Nation that welcomed 50,000 players to our tournament and training facility this year. <clears throat> As you can see from the great opening, the purpose of this webinar is to provide additional academic support available from Valley Prep for families interested in improving their qualifications for college admissions. This program will enhance a student athlete's ability to qualify for additional academic financial assistance and or qualify for admission to a higher academic college if that is your goal. We are extremely proud of the many success stories and accomplishments of our alumni, and we look forward to continuing that trend. As you know, our mission statement at Diamond Nation is to advance young students, at student athletes, opportunities both on and off the field. We do this by concentrating on our five main objectives, which are education, evaluation, development, competition, and exposure. First, we educate and we provide uh, the parents with a, and players with a wide range of information related to athletic and academic requirements, including benchmarks needed to meet your goals in the classroom and on the field. We also outline the importance of the timelines involved from eighth grade through your junior year so you stay on track to meet your goals. Next comes the evaluation process, whereby we assess a player's current skill level in comparison to your peers using grading scales utilized by college coaches and professional scouts. These grading scales deal with both current and projected levels of performance related to various skill sets. Development is a top priority, and we use our professional instructors and staff to provide year-round practice and skill development uh, programs to advance a player's skill level depending on age and grade. Competition goes hand in hand with development. It's important to achieve success and apply your skill in a competitive environment. 
This is accomplished by playing and participating in the many tournaments at Diamond Nation and other selected tournament venues throughout the year. After meeting all these goals and objectives, the student athlete is now in the best possible situation to display his or her skills through our extensive baseball and softball network with college coaches and professional scouts. This exposure should hopefully result in scholarships, financial aid, and or professional contracts. Since we started this program, we have helped more than 500 student athletes procure millions of dollars in college and or professional signing bonuses. Just this month, we have, we've had our pleasure of seeing many of our players officially sign their national letter of intents to play at some of the best schools in the country, which include Clemson, Tulane, Virginia, Maryland, Ohio State, Stetson, and Seton Hall, just to name a few. Since the educational component, component is so important, we feel that Pamela and her team can really help our Diamond Nation student athletes advance their college opportunities. We look forward to hearing Pamela's presentation and her recommendations this evening. So without any further ado, it gives me great pleasure to turn it back over to Pamela to get started. Thank you very much. Jack, thank you so much for that. Congratulations to all those students. That's incredible. Yeah, it's exciting. It really Very is. Exciting. And you said yeah. such an important word there, competition. And I'm just thinking about these are athletes who compete on the, on the diamond, on the baseball diamond, and then they also compete in the classroom. And that's, that's really yeah. where the synergy of our partnership comes in. I'm just so, so tickled that we've uh, decided to proceed uh, in this partnership. Um, what, what would you say about uh, the role of competition in those two venues for these students? I think it's important, you know, it's, it's just like life skills. Uh, competition becomes important. You have to, uh, if you want to excel, whether you're on the field or in the classroom, uh, you need to understand that things are not just going to be given to you. You have to work hard for it and you let, need to learn the skill sets required, whether it's academics or athletics. 100%. I knew, I knew when I, uh, I knew when we first met back in the summer, uh, and I had uh, the experience of speaking and spending some time with you that you were so dynamic and your background and what your, uh, what your company does and you, how you tutor stu uh, uh, students and uh, the services you provide, I really felt like that you had to be part of Diamond Nation and get involved with this because I think you'd be very helpful for us. I love that we met on the 4th of July, an all-American holiday, we're talking about the all-American sport, and now we're gonna help some all-American kids achieve the all-American dream. What a beautiful thing. Jack, thank you so much for being here. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and get started giving them some great information, and uh, thank you again uh, to everyone at Diamond Nation who helped to make this possible today. So let's go ahead and um, you know begin by thinking about who we have on the show today, we do have uh, not just myself presenting, but also uh, a member of my team, Kenan, one of our team leaders uh, at Gate and, and Valley Prep. So we'll be uh, welcoming Kenan shortly. Uh, as we get started, I thought I'd share what your questions were when you registered for this webinar. Do you remember? You told us your most burning questions. Take a look at this chart. It's your first of many charts of this webinar. And look at what your number one burning question was. Almost half of that pizza pie says you are nervous about building the right fit college list. You know what? I'm not surprised because did you know there are 4,000 schools in this country? Four-year, two-year, public, private. I mean, the odds of someone being able to fluently figure out that entire navigation are pretty slim without some support. Uh, the second number there, 28%, is a strategizing financial aid. Good news for you, this entire webinar is about saving you money. So the merit-based financial aid that we're going to be talking about uh, is going to be critical. Uh, you can see some of the other things you guys said. Thanks so much for filling out that webinar. And I just thought we'd start with a story. Hello, this is Anthony. I want you just to say hello to Anthony and imagine your student. This is just a, one example of a student that we worked with here in Los Angeles. Baseball player like many of you. Came to us in ninth grade. I remember his mom, Beverly, meet, meeting me at Starbucks and saying to me, you know, Pamela, 
He's a great baseball player. There's a lot of uh, potential here athletically. I just want to make sure he's got the right things. He's got to have the right grades. I'm not sure how to navigate all of these things. Can you help me? And I remember reaching across the table, taking her hand and saying, Beverly, I'm going to take you through this process. This is her, her only son. So it really mattered very much to her. As you can see, fast forward a couple of years later, Anthony's a senior, he's on signing day, he's got merit-based financial aid, he's confident, he's a young man. He is no, no longer a boy, he has grown up. And this process takes our girls to women, it takes our boys to men. It is a real interesting uh, time in the life of a person coming of age. And so that's an exciting uh, piece of this entire process, but we've got to start off by keeping it real we got to talk about money. we got to talk about the fact that college is very expensive. And you can see here some numbers. So what do you believe when you look at this? Well, public is about 10K a year, public in-state schools. If you're out of state, you can double that. If you want a private school, which are many of the more, uh, some people would call prestigious schools, certainly the more selective or highly selective private schools, you're looking at 35 and sometimes 40,000 a year plus per year. And that is just for tuition and student fees. We're not even talking about the cost of dorms and food and everything else. So let's just agree that we are, we are talking about something that costs money. Now, when you look at these numbers, I'm, I just want to caution you that you're not just mentally doing the math and saying, okay, what is the total spend? I'll take that number and I'll multiply it by four. Because, uh, 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 unfortunately, there has been a trend in recent years. A lot of students who go into a bachelor program that typically would have been a four-year degree are taking longer to graduate. And if they're there for five years, guess what you're paying for? Five years. So there are many moving parts. I'm not saying that always happens, but sometimes it does. So we want to just be realistic when we're talking about money. We're going to be talking today about merit-based financial aid. And we have a framework to help you understand what that means. So merit-based aid is not need-based aid. It's not the aid that you're getting through your FAFSA with student loans. And yes, Pell Grants for lower income families are a wonderful thing. And Stafford loans, whether subsidized or unsubsidized, can be very helpful. But are you aware right now how high the student debt level is in this country? Would you believe it if I told you that we have hit $1.8 trillion in student debt? I vote that we keep your student from having to take on loans and debt by maximizing the merit-based aid, which by the way, they never have to pay back. That is free money on the basis of making the right moves. Here's the right moves, guys. Look, the word of the day is gate. Uh, you, you can see that we're talking about opening the gate for your student. G-A-T-E is an acronym, and this is really just a framework for you to think about how do I get my student to the merit-based aid. Look at this. This is an equation. You see those plus signs and the equal? What does it take to get the merit aid? Strong GPA with course rigor plus applying to the right fit colleges, which we're going to talk about how to help you do, plus the testing piece. We're going to talk about test optional all the changes that have been happening lately, and then those all-important essays, I call those the magic bullet. That is a very important piece of this process. Once you put those pieces together, you are looking at the potential for merit-based financial aid, and it is a life changer for many, many students, putting them in a position to be able to compete for some of the top schools in this country, or even schools that are just the school of their dreams, the right place with the right team that they really want to play on, D1, D2, D3. Every student has a different pathway. We're not saying every student should be doing the same thing, but we're going to give you information right now as mom and as dad to, to, to know what you need to be doing. So uh, at this time, I want to invite uh, my colleague, uh, our, our team leader at Gate and Valley Prep, uh, Kenan. Kenan, will you join us? And let's talk about this for a moment. Hey there. <laughs> How are you doing, Pamela? 
Everything's great here. I'm so pleased that you're able to join us. I know you're going to lead us off and talk about the G, that we're going to talk about strategies for making sure students have strong GPAs. But can I just ask you to kick off by talking about this slide and, and the way this methodology, this framework works? Uh, sure. Right. So here we see, uh, it's actually beautifully laid out, grades, applications, testing, and essays. And the way this framework works is it helps you understand how to maximize the efficiency of your input time. Uh, anyone in ninth grade has to seriously be thinking about how to make sure they are prepared to keep their grades high. Uh, and that should actually be happening before ninth grade. We're talking like seventh or eighth grade, hopefully. You know, they're understanding what type of learner they are. Are they an audio learner, kinesthetic, visual? Are they memorizing correctly? Are they researching correctly? The type of skills that are going to keep their GPA strong all the way throughout high school. Tenth grade is when they should be starting to build that list of right fit schools. We like to help students build a list of eight to 12 best fit schools. And of course, 11th grade and 12th grade, as you can see, where most of the focus would be on testing. That's the SATs and the ACTs in 11th grade. And of course, in 12th grade, it's essay time. Uh, and I would like to start off, you know, talking about grades. Um, you know, my name is Kenan. For anyone who doesn't know, uh, I, I really am excited to be here. I love what uh, we were hearing before about the need to prepare for a competitive landscape. Um, GATE really is such a powerful and influential framework. I should know I helped write it. Uh, I've been with Valley Prep for more than seven years, actually, at this point, helping students prepare for SATs and ACTs, helping them write those compelling essays for personal statements. And last but not least, making sure they have the skills to keep those grades high. All right, so I don't want to waste any more time. Let's talk about grades. Uh, in the next 10 minutes or so, uh, I have a few goals. I want to help you understand what the GPA landscape looks like out there right now, what the numbers mean in comparison to other GPAs, right? And lastly, why the standalone GPA number matters, of course, but more importantly, what it is tied to and why that matters even more. So what we see here on screen, you know, I, I know you are all probably very familiar with what a normal distribution is. What we see here is a bell curve of probability. Now in a fair universe, if we were to go out there and select 10,000 high school students at random and just graph their GPAs, zero to 4.0, you would expect in a fair universe to see this right here. Uh, the red line is a normal bell curve of probability. Underneath we have some fun animation, but you would expect to see that curve. The large hump in the middle would represent a 2.0 or C average GPA because C is simply literally defined as average. On the far right hand side, you would expect to see those 3.9 or 4.0s, that A range. And on the far left hand side, you would see my favorite, the F category, because F means favorite, right? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I hope not. Uh, all right, so an interesting phenomenon has been occurring over the past couple of decades. We call it grade inflation. That's right. It's not even in the CPI index and even grades are inflating these days. We, we can't escape inflation. I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> so when we go out there and find those 10,000 random students and graph their GPAs, we don't see what we would expect to see on the left here, that normal distribution. We actually get a curve much like what is on the right, okay? It is the that central hump where most of the population lies is getting pushed over. Now, we don't, we don't have a number line here right now, but that middle hump is actually hovering around 3.0. This is happening for two main reasons. Number one, Honors, AP, and IB courses are being graded out of a different scale. And number two, there's a tendency these days to award higher scores for work that would have received lower scores in the past. And I will talk about these in part. Many high schools across the country are awarding 
AP and IB courses or grading them on a scale of 0 to 5.0. And high schools these days, many of them, are grading honors courses out of a 4.5 scale. So consequently, come application time, many colleges and universities are receiving applications with GPAs 4.8, as high as 4.9, with course rigor off the charts as well. But what this means is if someone simply says, hey, I have a 3.9 GPA, well, what does that mean anymore? Does that mean they took all AP courses and got a bunch of Bs? Or does it mean they got all A's in a standard course? Or, or does a 4.1 mean they got B pluses and A's in all honors courses? Or just B pluses and APs? What does it mean? These days, you have to look much deeper in the transcript to understand that number. Number two, there is a tendency or a trend uh, for work to be awarded higher scores these days than comparable work in the past. So quite simply put, today's 3.0 is yesterday's 2.0. All right, so now we understand that. How do we use this information to maximize our merit-based financial aid? How do we get that money? I'm gonna introduce GPA tip, the one, two, three, four rule. Please, if you can, take a screenshot of this right now. Just go ahead and take a screenshot of this right now. Save it somewhere. Uh, and if you have any questions about it, of course, we have that live chat. If you have any questions at all about anything, I encourage you to please uh, type that into the live chat and we'll address it in the Q&A later. All right, so this is perfect. And the, the screenshot, uh, this graphic lays it out very perfectly. Uh, the one, two, three, four rule. In ninth grade, you should be taking at least one honors class. In 10th grade, there should be at least two honors, AP or IB courses, and so on and so forth, right? 11th grade, three honors, AP, IB. 12th grade, four. Now it says GPA uh, tip and it says one, two, three, four rule. I wanna say that it's, it's more of a guideline. This is not a set in stone requirement but for highly selective schools, and please hear me out on this, for highly selective schools, this is a bare minimum, an absolute minimum. If you have your eyes set on a highly selective school, this is a bare minimum, okay? Uh, colleges and universities have a lot of data this, uh, these days as well. They can see which courses your high school has and what percentage of difficult courses your student is taking. So let's say your high school offers five AP courses and you've taken four of them. Great, it looks like you have taken 80% of the available difficult college prep courses that are available to you. But if your school has 10 AP courses and you've only taken four of them, well now it looks like you've only taken 40% of the college prep courses available to you. And, and all of a sudden you don't look like much of a go-getter. <laughs> So the importance is to do the best you can to build course rigor. Now we also understand that this isn't possible for everyone, right? Like many students are involved in sports, clubs. Sometimes students have learning differences that might make a schedule like this not so feasible. We understand that. And our team at Valley Prep can guide you one-on-one -on, -one on what type of course schedule is gonna be the best fit for you, all right? But uh, this is certainly a very powerful guideline. You're gonna wanna save this. Uh, and my last note on what type of courses should be taken involve tethering it to a possible intended major in the future. Now we also know that 9th, 10th, 11th and 12th grade students certainly may not know exactly what major they're gonna choose come college or university time, right? That's very understandable. But they might know the direction, right? So they might not know precisely that they want to be a bioengineer, but they might know that they have a bent towards science. So when they follow this one, two, three, four rule, they're gonna to wanna to make sure to stack those courses in that scientific direction. Now, if you have a student that's just has to be on Broadway, right? Or they want to be a philosopher, they're going towards the humanities. They are gonna to want to take courses 
that are tethered in that direction. Because come application time, the most important thing is having a cogent, cohesive story to tell. All right. So I can already hear some of the whispers because I've... That's right. I've got a, an extra mile strategy for you here because some people think that, uh oh, you know, my school doesn't offer that many AP courses or IB courses. What am I going to do? I have an extra mile strategy for you right here. Let's see it on screen. <laughs> All right. This is golden stuff. Okay. Please take a screenshot of this as well. It is dual and triple transcript submission. So if you're out there thinking, Kenan, you just told me I need to take two AP or IB courses sophomore year and three junior year, four senior year. That's nine courses. My school doesn't have that many courses. I'm toast. No, you're not. Our loyalty lies with your student and your student's future, not with your high school. All right. So if your high school doesn't offer the courses you need, that doesn't matter. Actually, you can enroll your student in an accredited online institution or at a nearby community college, and you can get those credits. And come application time, what do you do? You simply submit both or all transcripts. All right, this is such an awesome strategy. Again, please screenshot this. This is so valuable. If you have any questions about this, throw it into the live chat. We'll address it later. Um, but if you know that you need to be taking certain courses and they aren't available at your school, it's okay. You don't need your high school's permission to go outside of the high school and get the courses you need. And in fact, this can kill two birds with one stone. You can make sure you get all of the college prep courses that you need and come university time, just pretend you're an admissions officer, okay? You're looking at a student's application. You say, oh, Wow, they took courses outside of their high school. Oh my gosh, this student was so hungry for education that they actually found a, an outside the box way to take more courses. Do I think I want this student on my campus? Yes, please. Acceptance pile, okay? The students who go, hmm, well, AP calculus wasn't available for me, so I just never took it. Eh, okay, rejection pile. I swear, this is how it works. You can gain that competitive edge by showing them how much of a go-getter you are. Take those courses online or at a nearby community college, get those credits, come application time, just submit everything. That is dual and triple transcript submission. We actually have a success story from one of our prior students named Kylie. She did this as well. We have a video from her. Can, can we roll that clip? I took college courses all throughout high school and now UCLA is accepting 75 of my units and after this quarter when I take 15 units I'm gonna have 90 which means I'm a junior in college <laughs> okay did everyone hear that that is just truly incredible when she entered college the moment she set foot onto campus she was already a junior she took so many courses during high school and she used dual and triple transcript submission to her benefit. And she shaved off two years of college. Think about the financial savings, okay? Because it's not just about obviously two years of tuition saved, but that means she entered her professional career two years earlier. And by the way, she's about to get her PhD two years earlier. That means she's two extra years in the workforce over time. By the time she's 40 or 50 years old, we all understand compound interest, right? The amount of money she's able to build with those extra two years over time is just insane, All right, So she saved the two years of tuition flat out. But in terms of her future and how well she's financially prepared for a comfortable life, it's hard to calculate what that even comes out to, uh, but that's just truly incredible. So, uh, as we can see, now let's see, we have a list here of the importance and how uh, grades factor with respect to college admissions. Can we get that next slide up? Uh, this one's really great. We have 16 factors in college admissions decisions. 
And as you can see here, grades were obviously considered by 100% of the 4,000 plus colleges and universities out there. Grades in all courses are considered by 100% of schools in the country as very important, all right? Grades are clearly very, very, very important. And second on the list, grades in college prep courses were considered important by 99% of the higher education institutions in this country. All right, so uh, amongst many other factors, grades are right up there as, as being extremely, extremely important. And for some of the rest of the factors, I'm gonna invite Pamela back in. Uh, Pamela, are you still around? We are here, and thank you so much for everything you just shared, Ken. And I want to point out a few things on this list to some of our parents who may be unfamiliar. These are strategies that we're going to be able to help you with. For example, you need to know what demonstrated interest is. And if you have not heard that phrase, uh, you know, we have trainings we can share on that. That's something that we, in, fa in fact, we're going to talk in a minute about the applications section. And this is part of what gets baked into our process with helping students uh, through the applications process, because many schools care about demonstrated interest. There are specific ways that you do that. Class rank is trending down. A lot of schools are not ranking anymore, but if your school is, that is a data point that the admissions officers are gonna want to see. Uh, just in the last couple of years, we've had the SAT two subject tests go away, but then other things became more important. So this is a an, an constantly shifting landscape. And I think what's important for parents to understand is you want to know who to trust to help you through that, because I guarantee if you've got a freshman now, between now and 12th grade, things are gonna keep changing all along that trajectory. And we make sure that everybody that we work with has in real time, like what's happening? How do I need to pivot? What do I need to do uh, for my student? So uh, that's so important. And, and Kenan, I just want to thank you so much again for your time on that. And without further ado, I'm gonna go on and uh, talk a little bit about the A section. Uh, Kenan, please stick around. I need you here for the Q&A. We're going to do some great Q&A at the end of this webinar. And now we're going to talk about why this can't just happen at your school. Okay. This is a shocking statistic I'm going to share with you. According to the National Association of College Admissions Counselors, the maximum number of students that a single counselor in a high school should be working with is 250. Now imagine if you were a college counselor and I said to you, hey, I've got 250 kids waiting out in the uh, hallway over here and you're gonna get them into college. That would be completely overwhelming. I started my career, I did student teaching when I was at Columbia University. I went on and did a lot of different um, you know, experiences in classrooms and in college counseling. If I had 100 kids, it was already overwhelming. We love our, our school counselors. We have tremendous compassion for the pressure they're under. But according to the data, they get 38 minutes per student per year. Imagine how much information your student isn't able to get in 38 minutes, because those minutes are typically used for, let's face it, picking out next year's courses, right? You want your student advocating for those honors and AP courses. That's an important point that Kenan just made, so make sure you uh, encourage your young person. When you get the schedule, it's not, oh, I guess this is what it is. It's, hmm, let's see. Let's see if this aligns with what our uh, objectives are. Uh, here you can see our first applications tip. I want you to be thinking about the eight to 12 schools that we've talked about being typical for a student to apply to, um, that you want to build it as a balanced list. And by balanced, we mean usually at least three or four safety schools, maybe five or six target schools, and sure, go ahead and put two or three reach schools on that list. But I can tell you right now what typically happens. Students will come in and say, here's my list. And it's like Santa Claus. Like they, it's, you know, oh, don't worry. I've got a balanced list. My list is Harvard, Yale, Stanford, Duke, you know, NYU, USC. They start listing 
schools that by almost anyone's definition are going to be reach schools for most, if not all, students, because these are highly selective schools, sometimes with single-digit admission rates. So you want a balanced list with the, approximately the numbers of schools that I just said. How do you know which category they are? You can go online or you can um, get some information that we'll share with you uh, as we engage. The 25th and 75th percentile tells you whether your student is falling in the sweet spot uh, in terms of GPA, in terms of exam scores for what these schools typically uh, admit. And what you don't want is for your student to end up on a wait list and then end up being deferred or rejected. There's, there's a lot of emotional and psychological stuff that goes into this. And I want to say that I'm also a mom of three, and we've been through this. Um, I really I, I come to this as a professional, but I want you to know I have human compassion for what you're feeling as a parent helping your kid through this. So having this data, please note the pro tip. Start this by 10th grade. Do not make the mistake of waiting. So many people do. You can see a gorgeous image there uh, from something we're going to be sharing with you later. Uh, with your permission, we'd love to show you something that we've got for you today. Uh, but to, to be able to find a geographic region and drill down and drill down and get all of the information that you need uh, can just save you a ton of time. And let's face it, who wants to just go out on Google and hope they find something that makes sense, right? You, you want to be able to have trustworthy information. And here comes an extra mile strategy as we give you our second tip for the applications process. So here we are going to talk about impaction. And we are talking about non-impacted majors. So the old question, hey kid, what's your major, right? Is a, it, it puts panic in the heart of a lot of young people because they don't know what they want to major in. They probably, if you asked them to list every major they've ever heard of and said, I'll give you $5 for every major you can list, they probably wouldn't even get $100 because they don't know that there are hundreds of different sub-majors underneath of the broad majors that populate everything that's available in those 4,000 colleges in the United States. There has never been, that I am aware of, other than what we're offering, a menu where you can go in and say, well, what, what are the possibilities? Like, let's explore. What are those categories? And so an impacted major is what you want to avoid. If they're impacted, that means they have way too many applicants for way too few spots. And so we're dealing here with strategy. The strategy is find programs that your student would thrive in that are not as competitive, not as many people playing a game of musical chairs hoping to be able to sit down. You want them to be able to have data, right? We've talked about this. Here come some charts and graphs. This is an image uh, from inside of uh, something we'll share with you later, but take a look. Imagine your student being able to click on a full menu of absolutely every major that exists. And when they click on that major, they can go into every sub-major that exists in any college in the US. This is a complete life changer for them to be able to explore. This is a wonderful exploration tool. So be able to click into business and say, oh, well, that isn't just business. That's accounting. That's entrepreneurship. That's a, a, a international business. That's, it, it literally goes on and on and on. And as they discover those things, imagine them saying, oh, I'm actually quite interested in uh, marketing. Click. Oh, every school, take a look at the bottom of this screen. Every school that offers a marketing program populates. Oh, and I only want to stay in Florida or New Jersey. I click and I limit by state. I can literally save so much time and just anxiety by being able to use a tool like this. So you want, no matter what you do, uh, to be able to think about avoiding impacted majors. That is your second tip. Now, your third applications tip. Uh, let's talk about when you apply. So applying early does give many students a sometimes 20% advantage over others who are applying in regular decision. Um, schools do like it when students apply early. Early action and early decision deadlines typically start around November 1st. And that means they need to be prepared. I can tell you everyone who works with us starts their essays 
in the summer between junior and senior year. We do not have students waiting. Timelines are critically important. We help you know all those moves. That's absolutely something that you do not want to wait until your student is trying to take multiple honors and AP courses. It's senior year. They've got all this pressure. It's a sporting season. There's things happening. And then, and then it's like, please go write a personal statement and all these supplemental statements. Are you kidding? They need to be able to sleep. <laughs> they need a balanced life. So knowing when to do what is so, so important. Um, you can see here an image. We actually are able to show you what is the weighted benefit uh, of applying early versus applying regular decision for many hundreds of schools in this kind of uh, platform that we're showing you here, which is, again, just data to, to guide your steps. We know you guys are bright. We know your students are bright. You know, you don't need us to, to hold your hand, but for us to be able to give you like, hey guys, here's, here's the scoop. Here's, here's what the odds are. Here's how you can move the needle and uh, just understand the factors is just incredibly important. Um, so keeping in mind that we move on to T, everybody's favorite, right? Come on, you know you love test prep. No, you don't. I don't know anybody that says, hey, I really would love to wake up on a Saturday morning, like right around 6 a.m. Can I just go and take a four hour standardized ex exam with a number two pencil? That just sounds so fun. Yeah, no, nobody has ever said that in the history of ever, I don't think. But with that said, it's inescapable for some. I do, I do really have to call attention here to what's been trending in these last couple of years. And depending on how you see things, whether it is a, a positive or a negative, the reality is that test optional has become a very trendy phrase. In fact, um, I've been doing a lot of research. I've been published a couple of times in the last year on my research on what's happening in test optional. I'm actually currently completing my own PhD in global leadership. And as I'm doing that, I'm really curious about the college access experience for students from all different backgrounds. And the testing piece is this inescapable variable that is perhaps escapable at some point, but right now, not so much. So take a look, uh, test optional. Test optional does not mean the same thing as test blind. You can read this slide as well as I can. The SAT and the ACT are both accepted by any schools that accept the exams. Let's begin with that. Uh, they are competitors, right? Um, there are four sections in the ACT, including a science section. There are two sections on the SAT, um, just basically evidence-based reading and writing and math. So there's English, reading, science, and math in the ACT. These are different, um, and not all students perform equally well on both. Take a look at the numbers at the top of this slide. Ooh, this is really interesting. SAT national average out of 1,600, right now it's a 1060. Merit-based financial aid doesn't start to trigger until you get north of 1,300 at many schools. How are you gonna make sure your young person bridges that gap? Well, that's something that you're looking for a solution for. There are free resources, certainly. You can hand them a big fat phone book looking thing from Barnes and Noble and go and have a great time. Hey kid, yeah, go take a bunch of tests. You can do that. Um, or perhaps you'll find a, a, a way that would be more pleasant for your student. Um, take a look at the ACT, 36 is a perfect score. National averages is 20.6. We're talking north of a 30 for merit-based financial aid at many selective and highly selective institutions. Uh, now, test optional means that there are schools that are gonna say you do not have to submit. And I want you to know from my honest heart that especially when there are health concerns or economic barriers to getting them to a place where the exams are being given in person, you have got to use your judgment as a parent. And I understand that, but I'm here to talk strategy and numbers. And I'm gonna show you some information right now uh, that I think uh, really blew a lot of people's minds when this came out. This is what has been happening in the test optional world recently. Here you see some selective and highly selective colleges. And you can see 
that the gold bar is significantly lower than that darker bar because the admit rate when there was, even though these, these were test optional schools, they are admitting more likely with students who do take these exams. And, you know, I'm not making a political statement here. I'm just giving you data. I mean, you can draw your own conclusions. But if you are able to get your student prepared to take that, um, one could argue, yeah, there seems to be a competitive advantage to that. Uh, that's just the way it is. Now, which exam is your student going to take? Well, I've got a tip for you on that today. So here comes a great tip. Um, you want to target the right test. Now, the truth is what you really want is a diagnostic. That is something that we provide at Valley Prep, and you can proctor it at home, and it's so quick and easy, and they don't have to wake up on Saturday morning. And, you know, the SAT versus H ACT thing uh, gets solved pretty quickly. But before you even get there, uh, let's play a little game. You know how you have left and right brain, and uh, so do your students, right? These, this is just the human brain. Uh, the left side of the brain does tend to be uh, something that is connected to logic and sequencing. It's very analytical and objective. Uh, the right side of the brain does tend to uh, be utilized more for what I think of as the humanities, uh, the arts, uh, being able to synthesize big pictures. And think to yourself right now for a minute, what kind of student is mine? Just think about your kid, right? I'm thinking about my three um, and even myself, and we are all on one side of this, and you can ask yourself whether you and your student are the same or different. It's interesting. How can you know? Well, which are they? What are their strongest subjects? Are they strongest in STEM, those science, technology, engineering, and math courses? That would be sort of a left brain uh, leaning kind of student, somebody who is strong on that side. If they are more right brain dominant, maybe they are stronger in English and social studies, the humanities and the arts. Get ready, drum roll, brrr, pow, there you go. That is my prediction based on over 20 years in this field of where your student is probably gonna test on the diagnostic. Although I gotta tell you, it's, it's true about 80% of the time. And until we get that diagnostic data, we don't 100% know, and it is such an important decision. You don't need them prepping for both. You know what drives me crazy? Can I just tell you what drives me crazy? Okay, it's, you know how easy it is for a counselor to say, well, just go and take both exams. Yeah, just go and take both exams. Pay for both exams, wake up on multiple Saturdays. And by the way, a lot of the schools require you to report every score. And so now they're seeing, even if it wasn't a, a, a positive experience on the exam, that is not the way to go. The way to go is to choose the right test and then implement that on the correct testing timeline. This is a screenshot slide. I want you to really take a close look at this slide. And this really gives you an idea, even if your student is younger, there is now not just the SAT and ACT, but of course there's a PSAT. Look how early those are starting, all the way back in middle school. These are opportunities for you to see where are the benchmarks, where is your student falling. Don't wait until they're in 11th grade to suddenly try to pull out a miracle out of a hat. Let them build their skill set across time. You want your head in the game younger than you think. The biggest mistake I see is parents coming in too late with too big of a, a heroic ask. Uh, we are educators, we are not magicians. You need to start soon, and we've got what you need, but you do need to start soon for yourself. So that's really important advice for you. Uh, hopefully this testing timeline is helpful. Now, this next slide may make you nervous, but it's another one you're gonna need to screenshot, and I have to say this ties to what Kenan was talking about, the connection between the grades and those test scores. Yes, indeed, they should correlate. And unfortunately, many, 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 many students nowadays are coming in the door with a 3.5, a 4.0, a 4.4. And then they do a standardized test and they've got a 1220 or a 26. And you can see that, that, that there is a disconnect between a 4.4 GPA and someone who is uh, not scoring as high on those standardized tests. As we saw a moment ago, some of those selective and highly selective schools care very much 
about those tests. They're like actually using it even in an optional world as a way to verify what they care about because it's not because they're mean. Listen, a lot of members of my team over the years, colleagues of mine when I speak at conferences, they are the admissions officers in these schools. These are really you know, committed educators and passionate, wonderful people, um, but they have a job to do. They are trying to mitigate against attrition. That's when your kid gets in and they can't quite cut it and they drop out. You know what that is? That's a twenty to $30,000 mistake for you because you're losing all that tuition and now the student has to start all over again, maybe take a gap year. And it's a disaster for the college because their U.S. News and World Report ranking, which is extremely important, some might argue too important, to these schools uh, can drop as a result of that. So the yield, they wanna keep high yield, they want low attrition. They want as many kids saying yes if they say yes to them and they don't want them dropping out. This is something to be aware of. You want to secure the GPA with rigor and you want to secure, um, if you decide not to go test optional, something that is um, correlated. So that is uh, an inescapable part of this. Uh, the last little uh, T image that I'll share with you is uh, again from inside our platform where we've got full length SATs, full length ACTs, drill sets, everything you need, uh, videos, interactive activities, um, so that it's kind of like uh, a virtual a virtual tutor. You've got, in fact, Kenan appears on the platform and so do I, and so do about oh, 30 other of our uh, team members. So we've got, um, you know, just a wonderful, diverse group of, uh, you know, committed, certified professional educators. You know, we're not like your Craigslist, you know, hey, let me just I need a tutor. Let me get a complete stranger off Craigslist to come and hang out with my teenager. That doesn't sound like a good idea. Uh, you want somebody certified, you want somebody insured, you want somebody who's got a curriculum behind them and all of that stuff. So, but this is how we do it. So when folks are working with us at Valley Prep, they're, they're working with us through the GATE platform because this is our curriculum that we have developed in-house since 2015. And I gotta tell you, um, I'm really proud of uh, every member of our team that has uh, made that happen. All right, deep breath, guys. We're getting to the end of it because we're already at the E. So let's talk about the essays. Now, when you're thinking about essays, uh, here's the mistake that I commonly see. A lot of parents will want to get involved. Uh, they want to read the students' essays, and then they want to give their opinions about the story that's being told. And what comes out the other end sometimes does not represent the actual authentic voice of the student, and the colleges can really feel that. Uh, we, this is not a time for mom or dad to say, come here, honey, let's work on our essays together. This is a time uh, to bring in a mentor who understands what it takes to go through uh, a step-by-step -step proven process to get to an end result that will likely uh, move the needle toward uh, the admission pile. And so here you have what we recommend. You want to choose the right prompts. Uh, did you know on the common application, um, your student is gonna have numerous uh, prompts that they can choose from, but many students, in fact, most students choose prompt number one. So the name of the game is differentiation. Uh, if you're taking notes today, and I hope you are, write that word down. Uh, what is my goal? My goal is differentiation. I want my student to stand out. Um, if I choose a, a prompt that is less popular, um, that is one way to stand out. If I tell a story in a unique way using unique language, that is a way to differentiate. And so when you see this idea of weaving of the narrative thread, I've been using this phrase, you guys. I did uh, literature and writing was my undergrad at, at, when I was in, uh, at Columbia and then went on and you know, was a classroom English teacher and did all of that before opening these companies many years ago. And this idea of weaving, you know, you just, I always think of it as a tapestry. Every single activity your student is doing is a, a different color of thread. And imagine a beautiful tapestry from the front. When you flip it over, it looks like a mess. It's just a bunch of colored threads, right? But there is that art and a science to how we weave the narrative thread. My team has been trained in the process that I have been using successfully for over two decades. So we are really very conscious about this. We don't write it for them, uh, but we coach them. And I, I can't even count how many times I've heard, wow, my student became 
uh, not only a better writer, but they're able to articulate who they are in a unique way that they just didn't have before. No one really uh, encourages this kind of writing in our young people, and I think they should. Don't you? It's, it's, it's beautiful when their identity is being forged through this process and when they've got somebody that they can trust to help them through it. It's, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, okay, that last thing. So for you athletes out here, I'm going to give you two topics that I'm going to recommend that you avoid because guess what? They're, they're just overly done and you don't want to kind of sound like everybody else. The first one is you want to avoid talking about the big game. So I'm so happy for you if you had the experience of bases loaded bottom of the ninth and you went up to bat and won the state championship or something. However, um, when students who are athletes start writing about the sport that they love, and it's not to say that's not one of many colored threads that can be woven, they tend to go very deeply into details about what was, who was pitching and all these kinds of things that are absolutely irrelevant from the admissions officer's standpoint. So I would caution you to be very careful about the big game essay. The second topic that you want to be careful about is the sports injury essay. So many student athletes, oh, this will be great. I'll talk about the time I tore my ACL. And then you get this medical thing and the student is wanting to apply to political science. It's just completely disconnected. So you, you do want to weave in whatever those legitimate experiences are that you've had, but you want to do it very carefully and absolutely tie to your intended major. You see, we gave you a little finger with a string on it so you don't forget. Emphasize the intended major. Not just, here's what I hope to do, but hopefully they're doing internships and apprenticeships between ninth and 11th grade, especially in the summers, so that they can use that to their advantage in the essays. They can talk about how they worked with that real estate agent. Real estate agent is one that we worked with this year, a student who's applying into some selective programs in marketing. She got an apprenticeship. She writes about that. So she's not just saying, I want to do marketing. She's saying, I've been doing social media for a major uh, real estate agent in the Santa Monica area in that case, right? It has a story to tell, a perspective, a unique narrative thread. So that's really important. And, and again, um, just keep in mind that although sometimes kids will write these in English classes, and believe me, I was that English teacher, I get it. Uh, there's, a, there's a different art form when you're talking about uh, application to selective schools. So keep that in mind. All right, and here comes one more extra mile strategy. We are getting into the home stretch and boy, I don't want you to go anywhere. If you have not been putting questions in yet, now is the time. What questions have come up? Throw those into the chat. Uh, my colleague Sylvia is here. Uh, we're, we're monitoring everything that's going on. We're just uh, really going to be excited to do Q&A with you. Here is uh, your last extra mile strategy. Uh, this has to do with interdisciplinary um, strategies on your application. It used to be that if a student was going to apply for a particular major, let's say pre-med, that was all they talked about. Nowadays, students might talk about pre-med intersecting an interest in art. They might want to uh, write an essay or frame their application as having to do with being able to illustrate uh, medical journals or textbooks. They may, they may have a very unique intersection. So be thinking about interdisciplinary strategies because programs and colleges are trending this way as well. You want your student to be able to seen, be seen um, sort of uh, three-dimensionally, not just as a one-trick pony. So what, what is the intersection of two or more? I had another one last year, a young man, uh, great sense of humor, um, and he was writing about his interest in performing arts, but also his interest in political science. Um, and that young man has over six figures in merit-based financial aid under his belt. So he was able to, you know, infuse his true personality in that. I just think that's so fun and so special. Um, here you can see some pictures of just a couple of the kids we helped in the last year. And, you know, what we're, what we're talking about right now are, are licensed, insured, well-trained team members. Everything we do is online uh, because, you know, because it is now, right? So you, no matter where you are in this entire country, can have access to the team that I've been building and training for all these years. And I, you can see the looks on these faces. We have fun. I don't hire anybody 
who I wouldn't want my kids to be able to sit at a dining room table with for 90 minutes and not have them, you know, be mad at me like, Mom, why are, my, why are you putting me with this, this person? My staff is awesome. Here come a couple of gifts for you. Uh, we have a Facebook group and we wanna invite you to join the Parent Revolution. This is a group that I personally oversee, post in a couple of times every week. I sometimes go live, I do all kinds of things there. Uh, so you're gonna find that on facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Parent Revolution. Uh, we'd love to see you there. And now we're gonna start talking uh, with your permission about some opportunities uh, that we can share with you today. We've given you a lot, of, a lot of data. I always feel like when I talk about these things, it's like I'm taking out a fire hose and I'm like, here, are you thirsty? <laughs> Here's a bunch of stuff. And people are like, whoa, this is a lot. Um, I don't want you to be overwhelmed. I want you to be empowered. This is about empowering you as you empower your student. Here are some gifts that we've got with your enrollment today. Uh, first of all, everybody is gonna get a copy of my Four Keys to College Admissions Success book. Uh, this was really a labor of love for the parents. From one mom to another mom or another dad, uh, what are the moves that you need to make? What are those four keys? I was so thrilled that Larry King wrote the introduction to this book several years ago. And uh, the forward is written by a former professor of mine who is, uh, a professor has taught at more than four uh, major universities, including Ivy League. So that was pretty exciting. Uh, we're also going to get you the Seven Secret Strategies PDF. This has some uh, little known tips and uh, tactics that will, uh, again, help differentiate, competitively position your student. You definitely want to grab a hold of that. We also have a virtual tours list for you, just as a, a free gift. Uh, this has over 900 colleges and their best YouTube links that have been curated of where you can take virtual tours and get information about those schools um, beyond what's just on their website. So these are this has been uh, very well curated uh, by a colleague of mine, Rebecca, and really appreciated her sharing that. Um, the 10 costliest mistakes, you want that PDF, right? Like don't be making the mistakes that cost you money so you can learn some more about the financial aid process. Uh, you're gonna get an activities organizer because guess what, in senior year, your kids need to have this all completely organized. You don't wanna wait till the last minute. Our students typically are able to copy and paste directly from here into the app once we help them organize it. And you're gonna get, you know, because we like even more gifts, uh, your target colleges list builder. This is actually uh, the format that we use as we help students build their list. Typically there's like 28 or 30 schools and then we narrow them down from there. But this is an exploratory tool that can really help you get your kid organized. And then finally, the How to Pay for College Without Going Broke ebook uh, for my friend and colleague, Brian Safdari. Uh, he had offered that out to our Gate family, so I know you'll enjoy that. You know, listen, at the end of the day, you want to make sure that your student has everything they need. And one thing that I think is incredible here is that you're able as the parent to not have to be the one who is doing everything, but they, that you can actually know what they're doing. Take a look at this. We're actually giving you a $200 gift today uh, with your gate enrollment. This is a big gift. This is 50 pages of parent guides so that whatever the student is doing in that platform, you're gonna have access to a resource that tells you what is the objective of this? What are these little quizzes and assessments? What is the vocabulary that I need to understand as mom so that when I'm at the dinner table with my son, I know what, what he's been learning and I can under, it's kind of like, you know how teachers have the, uh, the teacher's manual for the textbook with all the answers in it? Yeah. This is what that is, and that is a really, really helpful thing. Uh, so without any further ado, and with your permission, um, I would like to reveal to you some offers that we have today. Um, thank you so much for uh, being a part of this and for partnering with me and with Diamond Nation as we get your student through the gate to the college of their choice. The first offer that we have for you today uh, and we've been told that the Gate platform has easily a couple of thousand dollars worth of content, over 20 hours of activities, trainings, videos, everything in a step-by-step -step process from G to A to T to E. It's all there from beginning to end. This is typically uh, a $499 investment. 
and enrollment that you're going to make for your student to help them get into that school. But take a look at what Diamond Nation did. They're paying the first $50. Jack Cust Sr. said to me, you know what, Pamela, I want every student listening to this webinar to get GATE. And so we're going to cover, we're going to cover the first $50 ourselves. So how incredible is that for just $449, your student will be not only enrolled in GATE, but guess what? We are going to keep them on that platform through graduation, a one-time enrollment, and you have access to this until they are done with school and through the gate and off they go to their college. So absolutely everyone here, including seventh and eighth grade parents, you want gate now. Do grab that offer. Uh, this is a one-time uh, offer that we're doing in this webinar, so you want to grab that uh, right, right now. And our second offer is going to go into the G support package. This is our GPA support package. Uh, just two easy payments, $13.50, and your kid's going to get 20 hours, 20 hours in any subject area, including AP. Uh, our, our tutors are great at getting kids to the four and the five on those AP exams. If they're struggling in math, if they're struggling in writing, we will help them through that. This enrollment fee is nominal compared to the merit-based financial aid that it helps position them for. So do remember that that is an ROI, a return on investment uh, that you want to uh, make sure you secure for them. So that is offer number two. Offer number three is our A packaged. Here you're getting 10 hours, and in 10 hours you won't believe what we can get done. In 10 hours, we can help them build the list, teach them about the demonstrated interest, make sure they're making all the right moves starting as early as middle school or ninth grade through what happens in 12th grade. Now typically, this is something that students, uh, their parents typically enroll them in the 10th grade level, but this is available for any student at any grade level. So I just want you to see uh, how that sets up. This is one-on-one. -on -one. I have personally trained this team, and uh, we're really proud of uh, what we're able to do, in, uh, as you can see in the results. And we're going to run some video at the end of the webinar where you'll see some of the students and where they ended up going, because uh, I love those videos, because it shows that uh, the job gets done. Let's take a look at offer four. This is T. I think you guys kind of get the G-A-T-E thing now, right? You're like, okay, I, I bet I can guess what's next. All right, so offer four, test prep, $1,800 twice, out the door. This is a 24-hour curriculum for SAT or ACT. We are taking your student through absolutely everything they need to get a, 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 an increased score. I can tell you our average has been for the SAT, between 170 to 270 increased points. And on the ACT, between four and seven points. We had one student last year who had a 12-point gain on the ACT. That was a new Valley Prep record. So when you're looking to get those point gains, again, because these help position the merit-based aid, you're going to want to enroll in offer number four, and finally, we have our E. And this, again, it's 15 hours. That gets you your student's personal statement, brainstormed, outlined, several drafts, honed, sharpened, ready to go, as well as supplemental essays for those 8 to 12 schools. Many, if not most schools, are asking your student to tell, why us? Why do you want to come to this school? And then they have... You know, tell us how you feel about this thing that matters to us at our school particularly. It takes time and students get overwhelmed. But with a mentor, it becomes a pleasure. So make this a pleasure for your student by placing them with a mentor who can take them through that process uh, with thoughtfulness and with a sense of peace and joy, which is certainly what we want for all of our students. With that said, I want to invite Kenan back in. Um, Kenan, let's wrap it up and just make sure everybody understands what we're talking about here today. Hey, did anyone miss me? <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> How's it going? No, no, great presentation, Pamela. I, I love all that information. It's obviously like so so valuable and at the end i didn't hear it yet i hope toward the end you can share your number one strategy for getting into highly selective schools can you i put it i put it in the slide deck at the end um as long as we've got folks okay. sticking around after the q a i will do it i will tip stick my best. That. 
great. That is normally a consultation, but if she's giving that away today, that is just truly gold. The top one strategy for getting into highly selective institutions. Uh, she's just giving that away at the end. Uh, this graphic right here is great. I call this the return on investment uh, graphic. It helps us understand how we best utilize our money, get the most mileage for our money, depending on where the student is in their matriculation journey. Uh, and so it sums it up quite well. On the left, uh, you see it says ninth grade. Now this is actually for parents of seventh, eighth, and ninth graders, because this is the G package, We're talking about grades mostly. And it's never too early uh, to build those habits that are necessary to keep grades high, as we know. With this package, offers one and two, your student is going to get best in class, one-on-one -on -one tutoring, in all subjects up through the AP level. And imagine how great it's gonna to feel to get your detailed bi-weekly notes so you can track progress without contention with your teen, right? You'll also get our popular newsletter, The Valley Voice, that is just filled up to the brim with up-to-date information of the ever-changing college admissions landscape. All right, and that is offers one and two. For parents of 10th graders, we just move along to the right in the graphic. Parents of 10th graders, the clock is ticking. Don't make the rookie mistake of thinking that there's plenty of time to wait. There are mission critical pieces that need to be in place now for that competitive advantage come application time. So you'll enroll in offers one and three, that's the A package. And of course you can add offer two if you do see GPA concerns, uh, right? If you see the GPA concerns. Now, parents of 11th graders moving over to the right, uh, you know, we say the T package here. The truth is many of you will want offers one and three, the A package, and four, the T package, if you haven't already identified your student's best fit non-impacted major and already built that list of eight to 12 schools out of the many thousands that are out there, right? If you've decided to risk the test optional approach, go ahead and enroll in one and three. But if you're ready to ramp up a competitive SAT or ACT score, go ahead and grab offer four as well. This is truly, this one right here is a grand slam opportunity to increase your students' merit-based financial aid and odds at acceptance for a selective or highly selective school. All right, and of course you can always add offer two if you see any GPA concerns. And parents of 12th graders, congratulations. Your student is almost there. You'll enroll in GATE with the Essays Coaching Package. That's offers one and five. The goal here is to empower your students to create their differentiation, right? With a professional who's trained not just in, in, edit, you know, in editing, but in truly mentoring the right stories that are going to help your student stay out of the rejection pile and off of the wait list. You want professionals who are trained in this area. Admissions officers want much more than what a traditional or typical English classroom can offer these days, but our step-by-step -step process is going to help your student hit that sweet spot between tone and topic and evidence of critical thinking ability. All right, so grab one in five, and of course offer two if you see any GPA concerns, because senior grades do still matter. Colleges look if they are maintaining their grades throughout senior. I will senior take a look at those after the webinar and make sure uh, that we reach back out. We're gonna be following up with you guys. Uh, we care about you, we care about your student. And uh, with that, uh, this is Pamela Donnelly coming to you from Los Angeles, thanking again our uh, partners at Diamond Nation, and we look forward to working with you and your student very soon. All the best. I'm going to the University of San Francisco with $50,000 scholarship. Going into this admissions process, I was so stressed out. I didn't know if I could even make it to the finish line, but I got into eight out of 13 schools with a 3.6 GPA, and I'm going to USC. George Washington University gave me 20000 a year, Indiana gave me 11000 a year, and I will be attending Berkeley next year. Gate had recommended that we apply to 10 to 12 colleges. So far we've heard from seven of the colleges, yeah. and all seven have accepted her. 
They prepared her, they showed her how to be organized. I got into nine schools and I'm going to be going to Cal Poly Pomona with a psychology major. I not only uh, upped my SAT score by 300 points, I also was able to increase my GPA by a lot. And, you know, I was just worried about getting into schools and where I was going to go. Um, and then luckily and happily, after all my hard work and studying and stuff like that, I got into 13 schools. Thanks to all your help, she got into all four UCs that she applied to. And UCLA, here I come. I got a lot of support, and as a result, uh, I, I got a 35 on the ACT, and I ended up with a 4.4 weighted GPA, a 3.9 unweighted, and I'm going to Brown in the fall. I'm going to study environmental engineering. I don't think he would have been able to do it on his own. Because I got help, I got into the school of my dreams, and pretty much every other school that I applied to. So Connor's going to have that opportunity and I'm going to be able to pay for it now because I got awesome financial aid and assistance. Next year I'll be attending Occidental College with uh, a $30,000 scholarship. I'll be playing swimming and water polo there. They got me a six point increase on my ACT which was amazing and I can't wait for all the things to come. When I saw the packet, I was ecstatic. <laughs> Beyond ecstatic, actually. I got into USC! My son has gotten into almost every single school that he has applied to. My GPA went up, I got the grades I needed to get to get into these competitive schools, and now I have the choices available to me. Um, I'm really excited about Berkeley School of Music. I found the college application process to be daunting. Not only did she get into the school of her choice, she got there, she was able to apply everything she learned, and made it a great experience, a great first year. I just got a 3.9 GPA because of you guys, and I can't wait to go to USC in the fall. Thank God we ended up at the same school, and we're starting in the fall together. <laughs> The scariest part of getting into college for me was probably having to complete all of these essays. By using GATE, I was able to make myself stand out in the college application process. I think GATE was really helpful in yeah. that respect. Um, I applied to nine schools and I ended up getting into seven. In my hand, I'm holding over $150,000 of aid offered to us. 